Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Linda True, and I'm going to navigate you through what to expect from AEA services as they take you through support through the birth to three process for children with hearing loss issues or who need to be tested following their birth screen. Again, my name is Linda True. I'm an audiologist that works for Heartland AEA in Des Moines. I also work with the DeafBlind Project of Iowa, and as an advisory member, I was Early Hearing Detection and Intervention Program of the Iowa Department of Public Health. So you've had a baby, congratulations. All babies in Iowa typically are screened at birth, whether or not they're born in a hospital or at home. This is done by either what is called otoacoustic emissions testing, or OAE, or Automated Auditory Brainstem Response Testing, or AABR. Your local AEA does support Eddie's goals for newborn hearing screening, which require in goal one that a child is screened by one month of age, for goal two that a child has a diagnostic hearing evaluation by three months of age if they have not passed their newborn screening, or their third goal, which is enrollment into an early intervention program by six months of age. In Iowa, the early intervention program is Early Access, a program that typically runs through your local AEA. So let's talk through our first goal, screening by one month of age. Eddie's first goal of hearing screening is to screen all newborn infants by one month regardless of whether or not they're born in a hospital or they're born at home. Hearing screening is done, as I said, by either OAE screening and or by automated ABR screening. For example, if your child is born in the newborn intensive care unit, they will automatically be screened using AABR. Most children born in the general population are screened with otoacoustic emissions at birth. So what is an OAE screen? An OAE test sends a sound down into your baby's ear and then measures the echo that the baby's hearing organ or cochlea emits back. And the difference between that and an AABR screen is that an AABR screen measures how sound is sent from your baby's hearing organ or cochlea up through the auditory nerve to your child's brainstem. Typically, these tests are done when your baby is quiet or sleeping. Oftentimes, they're done when you're not even there. So make sure you ask your birth center whether or not your child has been screened prior to your dismissal. Again, if your child is born at home and not at your hospital, a local or regional area education agency or AEA can provide their initial hearing screening at an AEA office free of charge. So you've had your initial screening. What happens if your child does not pass? Typically, we recommend that your child is retested by two weeks of age. Oftentimes, you will be told that your child has not passed or has a refer response. If their initial newborn screening needs a second assessment, it's very important that this is done by two weeks of age. This can be done back at your hospital, or again, your local AEA is able to schedule and test your baby for this screening free of charge. Also, the AEA or your hospital will report these results to your primary medical care provider. It's very important that you follow up with a two-week screening, because in Iowa, this is also a time that we check for cytomegalovirus, which is a syndrome that some babies can be born with. It is very important that CMV testing is done prior to 21 days. The reason is because following the 21-day timeline, the vaccine for CMV is ineffective. Cytomegalovirus is a virus that oftentimes people come in contact with 
through the saliva or urine from young children. If a pregnant mother does have CMV, she may not even feel it, but her baby may have serious implications. Disabilities that may be caused by CMV can depend on when during a pregnancy a mother obtains CMV. Typically for a mother, this may feel like a mild form of flu, or you may not even have any symptoms. You may be able to lessen your risk of getting CMV by reducing contact with saliva and urine from babies or other young children in your household. The saliva and urine of children with CMV have very high amounts of this virus. You can avoid getting a child's saliva in your mouth, for example, by not sharing food or utensils, cups or dishes with your child. And as always, you should wash your hands after diapering a baby. Another reason why you may want to have follow-up screening at an AEA or your local hospital is if your child is born with risk factors for delayed or progressive incidence of hearing loss. Certain syndromes and birth conditions may lead to your baby having a risk factor for delayed onset of hearing loss, even if your baby passes their newborn hearing screening or their two-week follow-up screen. If your child does have a risk factor, they will need to have periodic hearing testing to monitor their hearing throughout their childhood. Typically, this will occur between the ages of birth and three. The rules for monitoring hearing testing for children with a high risk factor are outlined by the National Joint Committee for Pediatric Hearing. Eddie's website will give a comprehensive list of risk factors and testing timelines. So you can visit Iowa's Eddie website at idph iowa.gov. Let's move on to the second goal, diagnostic hearing by three months of age. If your baby does not pass newborn hearing screening, your baby will have to have a diagnostic hearing screen. This means that an auditory brainstem response test will be used to test your baby's hearing threshold or the lowest level that they can hear. We will check how loud we need to make different pitch tones in order for your baby to hear them. This can be done for free at some of Iowa's AEAs or at a diagnostic center located in Iowa. Although audiologists, ENT physicians, and primary medical care providers know the 136 guidelines, you may also need to advocate for moving your child through the hearing testing process. If your physician or audiologist recommends additional screening following a failed newborn screen or a two-week follow-up screen, you may need to advocate for a diagnostic test. Please note that if follow-up testing does indicate a medical concern such as middle ear fluid, your child can still and should be tested using a diagnostic ABR and should not be continuously screened. Although it may be that a medical concern is causing some temporary decrease in hearing, there may also be permanent underlying hearing loss. It is important to continue with audiologic testing, even if your child is receiving medical care for a temporary condition, such as an ear infection, so that your child can receive the most appropriate medical and language learning interventions. Below are a list of local AEAs who provide diagnostic ABR testing. Diagnostic ABR testing can be found at our Bettendorf office at Mississippi Bend Area Education Agency, in the Des Moines and surrounding areas through Heartland AEA, the Prairie Lakes Area Education Agency at Storm Lake and Fort Dodge areas, or at Northwest Area Education Agency in Sioux City. If you are not close to one of these providers, diagnostic centers are located throughout Iowa. Please check with your local AEA, and if they cannot provide ABR testing, check Eddie's webpage below for an Iowa Diagnostic Center near you. So what happens during diagnostic ABR testing? ABR testing is done by sending a sound into the child's ear and measuring whether or not the cochlea, or hearing organ, will pass the sound up to the baby's brainstem. Typically, a child is sleeping during this test and doesn't feel anything. The audiologist will put a few sticky pieces on your child's forehead and near their ears to make measurements. 
During this time, sound is also going through their ears using soft earphones. Extra time is set aside following the ABR test so that your audiologist is able to talk through the test results and explain next steps to parents. If you find following a diagnostic ABR evaluation that your child does have a hearing loss, it can be a very difficult experience for a parent and you will need some time to process this information. There are several online parent-to-parent -parent supports that are available for parents at this time. To find where you can receive support services, please contact Eddie's long-term partner, Ask Resource, at www.askresource.org. There are other great resources that are available for parents as well. Hands and Voices is a national and state organization that can help families of children with hearing loss. And you can find their information at their website at www.iowahandsandvoices.org. Also, you can look back at the Eddie webpage to find their parents' resources pages that will give you several resources that will help you through this time. Keeping in mind that while you're processing the information that your child has a hearing loss, we know that the earlier a child is able to receive supports for language learning, the better they will be able to communicate their wants and needs. When you can't communicate what you want or something that you need, it oftentimes can lead to frustration and behavior of acting out because they can't communicate what they would like. So what are your next steps? Although it may be difficult to think about next steps when your child has just received a diagnosis of hearing loss, there may be other health concerns going on that take time and precedence. Parents still need to keep in mind their next steps for referrals. Referral to supporting providers will help to offer you additional family support and give your child additional services that may be helpful to their overall development, including language development. Referrals might include early access, which is family-centered support, a referral to an ear, nose, and throat physician to check for any medical conditions that may be causing temporary hearing loss, additional hearing loss, or to check and give medical clearance for amplification options. You may also be referred to another audiologist, a pediatric audiologist, who can discuss amplification options with you if they are appropriate for your child. Again, a referral to Ask Resource will help you receive parent-to-parent -parent support and can also guide you to deaf mentoring if your child has hearing loss and you would like to pursue additional communication options. If your child has a specific syndrome, their hearing loss may be related to that. An audiologist can offer you additional referrals, such as a referral to the Deaf Blind Project of Iowa or coalitions for specific syndromes. Oftentimes, if people are looking for an oral approach to language learning, they can get additional speech language support services through private therapy. Speech language support can be referred for by your primary medical provider, or you can ask your audiologist for that provider service. At this time, you will probably receive Eddie's Parent Guide in the mail. Eddie's Parent Guide will be sent to you to provide you with those next step resources and outline several options for beginning communication services for your child, including supports in the areas of hearing amplification devices, spoken and signed language services, family supports, and information about early access. I was early intervention service provider. Additionally, a more comprehensive resource guide can be found at the webpage. So at this point in time, we're going to move on to our third goal, which is early intervention services by six months of age. In Iowa, our current early intervention services are provided through Early Access, a birth to three program that works within Iowa's AEA system. When a child has a hearing loss, that child is automatically qualified to receive Early Access supports and services. Iowa's Early Access program is a family-based program that helps give families resources to enrich their child's growth in learning in several areas. Early access can support your child in the areas of communication, behavior, physical and occupational therapies, deaf and hard of hearing supports, and in-home early learning resources. 
More information about Iowa's Early Access Program can be found at the link below. Additionally, more information regarding Early Access Referrals and Family Support can be accessed through Iowa's Family Support Network. This, this support network can also be accessed through Eddie's parent pages. Early Access will create a team of support for you if your child has hearing loss or deafness. There may be several providers and we are able to provide whatever services your child needs. Typically, those service providers may include a service coordinator, a teacher of the deaf or hard of hearing, TDHH, an educational audiologist to consult with you, speech language pathology, and an early childhood special education consultant, which will look at areas that need to be addressed prior to your child entering school. So what is the difference between an audiologist on your early access support team and a teacher of the deaf? A teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing on your team will meet with you fairly routinely to discuss communication needs and help families with accessing and learning sign language, oral language approaches, and tracking your child's communication milestones. The teacher of the deaf again will meet with your family on a regular schedule to determine how you can best implement your chosen communication method. An educational audiologist will consult with you during periodic intervals, such as team meetings or as requested by parents to help with learning how to put in hearing aids, help with strategies to keep devices on your child's ears, help understand reports you might receive from an ear, nose and throat physician or your pediatric audiologist. Your educational audiologist will also monitor your child's receptive communication, which means how they're taking in information and their responses to environmental sounds, including speech and common household sounds. It's important to remember that whether you choose an oral, manual, or total communication approach with your child, your child is actively learning language. Children who do not have a hearing loss often pick up sounds or words and repeat them. We will also repeat them and add on to them to create more context for your child. Children with hearing loss also need this type of language stimulation. However, your child may not be able to hear you when you repeat those sounds without additional visual, tactile, or auditory cues. Your early access team members, deaf mentors, pediatric speech language pathologists, and online signing videos are all examples of ways that parents can help learn to create an active language learning environment in your home. For an example of creating an active language learning environment, visit www.mydeafchild.org to find one parent story. It's also important to remember that whatever your choice is to use to communicate for your child, is right for your child. If you want to speak with your child, sign with your child, or both, you can do that. If you want your child to have hearing aids, if they need cochlear implants, or if you would like to just have them learn signing and not use amplification devices, that is up to you. Whatever choices you make today are right for your child today and for your family. It's okay to utilize different services, communication strategies, and language supports for your child. However, language supports should be in place regardless of the type of communication style you choose. This means that you need to commit to learning and actively participating in the choices that you make with and for your child. If you have chosen hearing aids, commit to having your child wear them during all waking hours. If you choose to have your child learn a form of sign language, Practice that language with your family members and your child very actively and encourage extended family to learn that language as well by providing them with links or videos to help them communicate with your child. As your child grows, you may have changing needs or find that their needs have changed over time. Your early access team members will meet with you every six months to reevaluate your individual family service plan and decide upcoming goals that match your child and family communication needs. So what happens when your child turns three years of age? At the age of three, IFSP services are discontinued. 
and a child may start having an individual education plan. Because Iowa's Individual Education Plan, or IEP, help provide students with services over the age of three years old, you may find that when your child enters preschool, they may have those services. Please keep in mind, though, that Iowa's IEP services are not based on whether or not your child has a disability. So many children with hearing loss do not have an IEP plan in place. You may request an evaluation for services after your child turns age three. And if your child does show a functional hearing concern, they may be eligible for an IEP plan at school. When your child enters public preschool or kindergarten, you may request functional testing for your child at any time. Functional hearing testing may also be requested throughout your child's primary and secondary school years at your request or as part of a child's evaluation for IEP services for another academic or behavioral concern. Thank you so much for joining me today to discuss AEA services and supports for your child ages birth through three. Please contact your local AEA with questions regarding today's video or if you would like to schedule an appointment for hearing testing. Thank you.